Let's pick up in Matthew 12, 33. We left off here. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Probably among my contemporaries, nobody has specialized in Matthew 12, 33, 34, like Pastor Casey Treat up in, uh, I believe it's Seattle, Washington. And he's written several books about this, that to change your life, you have to change your heart. You've got to change the root of the tree. And uh, the reality is on this, that a lot of the outcome of our lives is based in parenting. But if we didn't have good parenting, see, somebody could say that's bad news. Well, the good news is you can learn that from fathers and mothers in the faith. You can learn it from the Word of God. You've heard me say a thousand times, I didn't know how to be a husband. And uh, I learned that from the Word of God. I learned that by reading James Dobson books. I didn't see that many great examples. So it wasn't really by observation. It was more by reading the Word of God and reading James Dobson books. I didn't know how to be a father. And, uh, but again, I, at that point in our lives, we weren't surrounded by a bunch of great examples. I learned a lot of that from the Word of God, from James Dobson books. And then also what I tried to do was to flip around in my mind things that I perceived to be negatives and flip them around in my mind and turn them into positive goals. I don't know why I'm on this. Somebody needs it. But for example, when Sue and I first got married, you could buy a, you could buy a, a three, maybe a four-bedroom custom home in southwest Arlington, brand new, for $40,000. Well, $20,000 to my father or to Sue's father would have been nothing. But we scrimped and saved and struggled for decades for no reason. It's ridiculous. And so something that I did was, rather than get bitter, rather than be angry about something so obvious my dad, Sue's dad, could have done, I just turned that thing into a faith goal. I just turned that thing around into a faith goal. You see, you can, man, you got lemons? Okay, make lemonade. I mean, you can take even the negative things in life and turn them around and, and turn them around and make them a faith goal. And so that's really one of the things that we had in our heart was to help our children with how, a house. I mean, why spend decades uh, struggling I mean, I was 36 years old before I owned a new car. I mean, people look at us today, you know, and they think, oh, man, you know, man, they got it made. Yeah, well, I was 35, 35 years old when I bought my new, first new car. We got people in this church, and, you know, they're not even 25, and they've owned a new car. But you can take stuff that's been done to you and turn that around and make that a faith goal. The point is the tree. So if you allow negativity and bitterness to remain in your heart, you're going to communicate that to your children. See, because what's in your heart is what's going to come out. When I was a little boy, when I was uh, five years old, we moved from Highland Park, Michigan to one of the suburbs. I was born in Highland, Highland Park, Michigan, which is probably the worst place in America. Ever seen Gran Torino? That's where I was born. And when I, what, But I remember the house that we lived in, and I remember that when you walked out the back door and you went down those steps, I don't remember which was which, but there was an apple tree and there was a plum tree. I was only five when we moved. So how did I know that one of those trees was an apple tree? Talk to me. And how did I know one of them was a plum tree? Okay, you single folks, 
This will save your hide. So when you're dating and there's cheap fruit, you got a cheap tree. When you have angry fruit, you have an angry tree. Are you getting it? When you, when, when you got uh, I'll sleep with anybody fruit, you have an I'll sleep with anybody person. So Jesus taught us you will know them by their fruit. Okay. So what I've got to work on in my personal life, what maybe you need to work on in your personal life, is changing the tree. Somebody might say, well, that's not, that's not even possible. An apple tree can't change being an apple tree. Well, we're not talking about trees. This is an illustration. We're talking about people, and people can change. But the reality is most people don't. And this, my friends, is the key to everything in God. I mean... If we're supposed to come into agreement with God, and he's perfect, and repeatedly in the word he says, I am the Lord, I change not. If we're going to come in agreement with him, who's got to change? We do. Okay, so he says, make a tree good. See, this whole concept of changing the tree. If you have a tree, I got all kinds of trees, man. I mean, I got, I got whatever they're called, regular pecan trees. I got paper shell pecan trees. I mean, I got, I got all kinds of trees. I can't change one of them into something else. They are what they are. But I can change me. Now, you moms and dads, this is what you ought to be doing. You know, parenting isn't like a pain, something, you know, you just do when you, because you have to, to keep them from burning the house down. You, you guide them and train them. The Bible says you train them in the way they should go. They don't want to go that way. You train them in the way they should go. Sunday we talked about patterns and how that the reason people fail in life is because of the patterns that you see evidenced in their lives. But where did they learn those patterns? When my father passed away, I didn't understand initially why he had two attorneys. We went to the one, what a disaster, what a liar, what a cheat, but I figured it out. It took me about two months, but I figured it out. He had that attorney because he was politically connected into Ford Motor Company. But that's not, he was not somebody you trust. Well, when I realized what a disaster we were in, I went and made an appointment and met the other attorney. What a shrewd guy. Oh my gosh. He was like something else. And I got to know him over time. He had three children and two of them were doctors and one of them was an attorney. And I told Sue when I got home, I said, people at that level, that's what they do. They don't like leave their children out in the yard to evolve or to, you know, like run around like coyotes. In other words, they're very deliberate that uh, these children are going to accomplish something. Do you see where I'm headed with this? So what is that? That's a pattern. In other words, people that are successful are successful. Right now in this culture, they want you to believe that a rich man is rich because he took advantage of the poor man. If that logic is true, some of you here tonight are fat because you took advantage of the skinny people here tonight. <laughs> right? If that logic, right? If that logic holds true, right? So some of you skinny folks, Trent, somebody here ripped you off. They ate your dinner. I mean, isn't that the culture? Well, that's ridiculous. The point is, the point is that success in life is about these patterns. Okay. A lot of this is child rearing. I used the illustration, Sue was in Sunday school. I used the illustration Sunday. There's not a racial bone in my body. I believe with all of my heart you can take any child in that nursery, white, black, Hispanic, Oriental, and put them with Sue Lingerfeld 18 years. They're going to be a productive citizen. They're going to be moral. They're going to be decent. They're going to work. They're going to have a job, and they're going to pay taxes. I don't care what the color is, and I don't care what country they were born in. It's training. It's not just environment. You know, environment, 
I mean, think about environment. I mean, people here, you know the problem with this country is nobody ever goes anywhere. The people in the worst part of the worst part of town, in the worst city, in the worst circumstances, are better off than most of the people on this planet tonight. But they don't know that because nobody ever goes anywhere. You've been around the world, right? Most of it is a toilet bowl. Most of it. So it's not just environment. You know, because in psychology, they use the word environment. It's not just environment. It's training. Putting your hand to something. Being deliberate about it. That I'm going to lead and guide these children in the way they should go. Does that mean they all need to be professional people and go to college and all that? No. But they need to, they need to be trained in the way they should go. And that is sexually, morally. And then they need, to, they need to know how to make a living. Some way, somehow. And not everybody needs to go to college. Probably not everybody should go to college. Uh, but vocational training. We have guys in this church that are jet engine mechanics and things like that. And they make good, good, good money. In other words, probably a jet engine mechanic makes better money than the average college graduate. So my point is to prepare and to train that child to be productive. Okay. I rehearsed all of that to say this. So what if you're here tonight and you're unproductive? What if you're here tonight and, and you just can't win? What if you're here tonight and you can't gain traction? You got to work on changing that tree. And the good news is we can. Now, you can't change the tree in your garden, but you can change the tree which is your life. You can do it. You know, in the social media today, I saw one of my things went out automatically that you can change your character even. And the way you change your character is set short-term goals, apply yourself, make them come to pass. And here's what happens. When you do that repeatedly, then that becomes a habit. And a habit, over time, becomes part of your character. And character, over time, leads you into your destiny. So, for example, some people are late to everything. They're late to church, they're late to work, they're late to their wedding. I did a wedding once, and when it was over and we were at the reception, the best man walked in, and boy, was he hacked because he had rented a tux and all of that, and he missed the wedding. And I said two things. I said, number one, how is this my problem? And I said, number two, we didn't seem to miss you. <laughs> but some people, right, they're late to everything, right? They're late to everything. They're late to everything. You know what that is? That's a bad habit. You can break that. You can change that. And what you have to do is, whether it's breakfast tomorrow or going to work tomorrow or whatever, to be on time at every instance and, and over a week or two weeks, you break the old habit, you establish a new habit. Am I helping anybody? Then you, you continue that on and the habit becomes your character. Now you're not the person everybody knows. Well, you know, he'll be late. She'll be late. No, you become the person who's on time. But it, it, this happens over time. Okay, the same thing is true with confession. See, you wondered where I was going. The same thing is true with confession because some people just have a negative mouth. And they don't understand. When we're, when we're talking about confession, I think sometimes people get the idea that if, if I just let one negative thing slip out of my mouth, and I have met, frankly, I have met my lifetime quota of weirdos. So if I, I'm, I'm 57, if I never meet another Christian spooky weirdo for the rest of my life, my quota is filled. <laughs> and I've heard people, you know, they say something negative and they say, you know, they, they, they like slap their mouth and say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that. And they just get all weird. <laughs> it's not about one confession. The words coming out of your mouth are not like hand grenades. You know, one will kill you. What I'm talking about is patterns. See? Because let's face it, <laughs> we're human beings. There's not anybody on this planet 
that has perfect confession. But the point is, what is the pattern of your confession? Is the pattern of your confession a pattern of prosperity? Is it a pattern of lack? Is the pattern of your confession sickness? Or is the pattern of your confession health and healing? Now, I got all kinds of notes. Let me condense where we're trying to go with this tonight. Sickness. How do you handle sickness? Now, you might be here tonight and say, well, you know, I just don't believe in sickness, and I've never been sick, and I'm not ever going to get sick. Well, okay, that's fine. But I live in the real world. And uh, door handles have germs, and, you know, at church we shake hands, and uh, if you're married, hopefully, you're physical with each other. I'm just saying, we live in a real world. And, 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 with regard to children, Children getting sick is not entirely bad. This is part of the process that God built into our bodies to develop a, an immunodefense system. So, but I've, I've had, again, I've had these weirdo Christians, and you know, th their child get the chicken pox, and they just think the entire universe is coming to an end, or that faith failed them. And now they have to give up on God or, you know, they're just crazy stuff. Some of these things are, are, are the natural sequences and progressions of life, and you deal with them as they come. Now, I learned from Oral Roberts himself that medicine is not bad. The night that Oral Roberts was healed, Oral Roberts had, uh, I forgot what disease it was, but the night he was healed, he was full of medicine. They weren't trying to do something spiritual. His, he, he had an older sister. She was married, and her husband came by with his older sister, and they put him in the car, and they took him to a tent revival. He was sick unto death, and he was healed. But that night, he was full of medicine. And so I learned from Oral Roberts, don't let... Other Christians or the devil put you under condemnation for taking medicine. The point is not how you get better. The point is to get better. Do you see this? All right, now this is a big deal with children because you read in the news every once in a while a horror story about parents who wouldn't give their children medicine and some of these cases go to court and inevitably people of faith end up looking like lunatics. If, if you feel so inclined to take your medicine and throw it out the car window, great, fine, whatever. Sue and I will stand in faith in agreement with you. But I don't believe we have the right to do that for a child. In other words, when that child grows up, if they want to have some crazy faith, well then by God, let them have some crazy faith. But they deserve the right to grow up. I had a lady come to me once. She had worked for me, and then she didn't, but uh, she came to me, and she was just distraught. And she had quit me. She had gone to work somebody else for somebody else, got fired, because she was sick. She was missing a lot of work. So she, she lost her work. She didn't have health insurance. And she went to John Peter Smith, and they told her what was wrong with her. Uh, she needed some surgery, and even with all of her financial lack, it was going to cost X, in other words, a percentage. And that was, you know, an issue. So she was all distressed. And so, but the, the sad thing is the main point of her distress was, well, I feel like I've just failed in my faith. I said, look, nonsense. I said, you have to live to fight another day. Faith is about living to fight another day. I said, job number one is to get well. I said, how are you gonna, how are you gonna recover financially if you can't work? How can you work if you're sick? You have this thing that has to be re remedied. I said, you've been to the doctor, they can remedy it. It's gonna cost X dollars, you have it left. I said, okay, then that's gonna burn your savings. But I said, how are you gonna come back if you don't get this taken care of? 
And it was like, it was like visually somebody lifted a thousand pounds off her shoulders because I said, it's okay to go get this taken care of. The point, and I told her this, I said, would it be better if you had great faith and you could just speak to this and make it healed in a moment? Sure. But I said, you're so beat down physically, financially, emotionally, that now you're beat down spiritually. And I said, you're weak. So I said, what you got to do is, is get whole. Then be in church, get in the word, and, and rebuild your faith. Get strong in the Lord. Am I helping anybody tonight? Amen. Look, when you are in a weakened condition, do not make big decisions. Do, say it out loud. I will not make big decisions make big when, I'm decision. when I'm in a weakened condition. No, you know, first thing to do is get back, get, get your strength back, get back to where you need to be. So the point is, are we against sickness? Absolutely. Do we want to avoid sickness? Absolutely. When somebody in our house is sick, do we want to see them healed? Absolutely. Another thing to always keep in mind is the role of covenant and prevention. And when I say prevention, for decades, we have prayed over our food. Thank you, Father God. We serve the God who blesses our food and water and takes sickness and disease out of the midst of us. So this is a daily confession. I mean, the way we eat, most of us, if you just pray the word of God over your food, that's a lot of praying. That's okay, that was a joke. <laughs> okay, but what are we saying? Thank you, Father God. We serve the God. You're bringing God into your meal. We serve the God who blesses our food and water and takes sickness and disease out of the midst of us. So that's who he is. That's what he does. So... It's a perspective. It is a mindset. This is, this is uh, my mindset, that I'm blessed. I'm not, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting sick. I'm getting better. I'm not sick. I'm, I'm, I'm under attack. Does that make sense? It's a whole different perspective. So we're talking about changing this tree. Isaiah 53, 5 says, With his stripes we are healed. And so, of course, Satan will come along and say, well, you know, you don't look healed, you don't sound healed, you don't feel, you sure don't feel healed. And the problem is we, we get into this agreement. Are we going to be in agreement with the symptoms? Are we going to be in agreement with the devil? Are we going to be in agreement with uh, what the doctor says? And again, Sometimes, I guess I might say something that could make me sound anti-doctor. I'm not anti-doctor. I just don't believe they have the final word. And a lot of times, they may just be telling you what is, but you have to understand, in this day and age, they're afraid of being sued, so they're going to tell you the worst-case scenario right out of the gate. So what do we say? We say, well, we say what the Word says. With His stripes, I have been healed. Now... If somebody came to your door and offered you a sack of rattlesnakes, I mean, what if UPS came to your house tomorrow and they had a great big box and you heard all the rattlesnakes in there rattling? Would you just say, well, I guess it's the will of God. Just dump them right here in the living room. Uh, and then would you go to praying, oh, Lord, dear, dear Lord God, I don't know what I'm going to do with all these snakes. I got snakes in the pantry, snakes in the bathroom. I got snakes under the bed. I guess this is my cross to bear. Is that what you would do? So the, the objective is don't accept the package. So don't accept the package. And so when you hear about people talking about swine flu, uh, oh my God, when Gerald Ford was president, what was that flu? And they gave everybody vaccinations and it killed people. What was it? No. Was it the Hong Kong flu? I mean, why would anybody want to get the flu from Hong Kong? You can get it right here in Texas. <laughs> but the point is, 
the point is, you know, everybody was just going crazy about this stuff. Jesus said, Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 13. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Say it out loud. We have the same spirit of faith. We have the same spirit, we have the same spirit of faith. We have the same spirit of faith. We have the same spirit of faith that David did. We believe, and therefore we speak. And then in Proverbs 6, 2, Solomon wrote, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. So basically what we're talking about is a message of deliverance. But it's... When I've met people that had trouble with this, people that failed at this, people that were not able to positively make confession work in their lives, here's, here's the reason why. They didn't work on changing the tree. They didn't work on changing the heart. They didn't work on changing the attitude. They just tried to put a lockbox on their mouth. You see, the apple tree is going to produce apples because it's, it's, that is its nature. The plum tree is going to produce plums because that is its nature. Now, if you don't think what I'm saying is important, this is one of the main thing that, things that breaks my heart, is these young people that grow up in the inner cities of America. We have a man in our church, uh, I think he comes at nine, sits over here, and he works at a high school in Dallas. It's unbelievable, the stories he can tell. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. These girls come into the school, you know, 11, 12 years old, and he says, Pastor Gene, some of them are just, you know, beautiful little girls. But he said, they come into that school. He said, you know, it's just a few months. He said, they're going to be pregnant. But the way they talk, all the gangster talk, I cannot imagine, my heart breaks, I cannot imagine, what would it be like to be a Latino growing up in East Los Angeles? I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine. Because if you don't join the gang, you could be dead. If you join the gang, your life expectancy is probably 25 max. What would it be like? What would it be like to grow up in the inner city of Chicago or Detroit. Oh my God. See? And we're talking about generations lost. There's a man that sat on, on the front row of this church at 11 o'clock this past Sunday, and he grew up in North Fort Worth, and he can tell you stories about gangs that'll curl your hair. And he told me that out of everybody he went to high school with, he's the only male he knows of that's still alive. And that's Fort Worth. What are, what are we talking about? Patterns. We're talking, and we're talking about how that if we don't make the change now to change our lives, it's going to impact our children. And then our children aren't going to know the way to go because we didn't train them in the way to go. It's going to impact their, our grandchildren. Do you see? So this is a heartbreaking deal because God has a wonderful plan for your life. God has a one, wonderful plan for your children, for your grandchildren. But if we don't train them in the way they should go, how are they going to get there? <coughs> but what about my life? What about my life? I guess I'm the only person here that woke up as an adult and, and said to myself, you know, uh, I got some real issues in my life because of the home I grew up in. I got to make some adjustments here. I got to make some changes here. I guess I'm the only one here tonight that ever had to deal with that possible reality that, uh, you know, I'm not criticizing or complaining or condemning mom or dad, but the reality is sometimes I have looked in the mirror and thought, you know, dude, you need some help. I got to make some changes. I've got to make some adjustments. Let me give you one with regard to prosperity. Let me go ahead and throw a hand grenade and offend you. 
We live in a culture today that is training the young people in the public schools, training people in the media to resent wealth. This is the dumbest thing that could possibly happen. I mean, I'm not going to mention any names, but I know of one guy that goes on vacation every month, and he should thank God, thank God, thank God for people making big money, paying big taxes. Because if it weren't for somebody making big money, paying big taxes, there wouldn't be a vacation once a month. Do you understand what I'm saying? So my great fathers in the faith... The main one, the primary one, Dr. Lester Summerall, when he would come, he came in his own jet. So when Sue and I would go pick him up at Love Field, I didn't say to Sue before we got out of the car, you know, look at that blankety blank. I mean, I wonder how come that blankety blank needs his own jet. That wasn't my perspective. My perspective was, cool, man, that is so cool. <laughs> I remember when we met Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. In those days, he was driving a Rolls. Now he drives a Bentley. But, I mean, when I, I didn't resent, I thought, well, isn't that what anybody who's famous in L.A. drives, right? Everybody drives a Rolls. They're famous in L.A. They drive a Rolls. I mean, right? That's what happens. But, I mean, I didn't resent it. I remember uh, the first time we went to Crenshaw Christian Center, and I sat there, and I looked at the cuffs on his suit, and I looked at the, uh, the collar on his suit, and I looked at the yoke on his suit. I could tell by looking at it, he didn't buy that in a store. He had that made. In fact, I remember sitting at the Maybe Center and hearing Fred Price say that uh, he had trouble with his feet, and so he had his shoes made for him, tailor-made shoes. I didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get offended at that. I thought, cool. I mean, the shoes that I'm wearing right now were made for me, made for me in Italy. They're alligator. The suit I, I'm wearing right now, right now, this suit, I chose the fabric. It was made for me in Rome. Well, how come I, how, why do I do this? Because I saw my fathers do this. But what if I'd hung out with yo bitch, yo whore, uh, <laughs> You know, I'd be standing up here tonight with a baseball cap turned sideways, tattooed, right? Saying, yo, bitch, yo, whore. <laughs> See, I got them to laugh. I got them to laugh. So which one's going to generate more money? Which one's going to generate a, well, I, yo, bitch, yo, yo, whore could probably generate a bigger church than I got, but... <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, they wouldn't be tithing. <laughs> right? But do you see how patterns make or break? Do you see it? Did anybody watch that Ben Carson video I mentioned here about a month ago? Now, did he say, yo, bitch, yo, whore, and all that? Did you notice? Oh, my God. See, to operate in that world, what are we talking about? Pediatric neurosurgery. I mean, when somebody comes in with their darling child, my darling child has a problem, and the doctor says, yo, bitch, yo, whore, has his baseball cap turned sideways, is he going to make a living? No, he has to, he has to operate in that world. The world, this... What I have just said applies to this physical realm. But my brothers and sisters, it also applies to the realm of God. How I speak, how I conduct myself, the attitude I begin with, all of this influences my success or failure in the realm of God. Can you see that? If that's true in the natural world, wouldn't that be true in the spiritual world? You know it's true in the military. Can you imagine going to the military and having an attitude? They would pound it out of you, right? 
it would be brutal. So it's yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I mean, right? So why would we think that when we come into the things of God, things like attitude and speech do not matter? So when I go to God, I just don't talk any way I may feel like it. When I go to God, I may feel like complaining, but I do not complain. I just don't. Because I read, I read Leviticus 22, 23, or no, 13 and 14, he'll kill you for it. That's how, that's what God thinks of complaining. No, I made up my mind years ago that for the rest of my life, a complaint from my mouth, he would not hear. Now, I'm a world-class complainer. You can check with my kids, man. I can check into a hotel. I'm a world-class complainer. I can go to a restaurant. I am a world-class complainer. But a, a complaint against God, you will not hear come out of my mouth. Number one, if he is who we believe he is, how could he make a mistake in the first place? And number two, if he changes not, how will my complaining change the situation? Number three, if he is love, what do I have to complain about in the first place? So my assumption is if something is amiss, it wasn't him, it was me. He didn't fail, I failed. I didn't apply myself to the word, or I didn't apply myself to the confession. So God has given you this ability. Let's wrap up in Matthew 15. Matthew 15, 11, What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. And verse 18, But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. So, it's not just about the confession. It's not, yes, the way we speak with regard to health and healing matters. Yes, the way we speak with regard to success and money matters. Yes, but let me tell you something. You can talk prosperity, but if you have envy in your heart, your talking prosperity won't get you anywhere. Can you walk outside on Sunday? and genuinely be happy for someone in this church who just got a new car? Can you hear somebody tell a testimony about how a debt got forgiven and genuinely be happy for them? Can you hear a testimony about somebody getting a new job and a great big pay raise or somebody getting a great big bonus on the job? Can you hear that and genuinely be happy? Because if you can't, you got to work on the tree. You got to work on your heart. Because here's what will happen. You'll try and have a positive confession, but your heart will betray you. And these three need to be in agreement. What you believe, what you say, and what you do. So even if you're trying to have a positive confession, if you don't believe in prosperity, and listen, Listen, this is a big deal for what's going on in this country right now. I cannot be a defender of my rights without being a defender of your rights. So I have to be an equal opportunity person. Do you see that? And this applies to everything. I can't be a racist. Because if, if I'm a racist, my faith's not going to work. I mean, how can I believe in success and prosperity for me, but not people who don't look like me? That right there will sabotage your faith. But then also, I've got to be an equal opportuni opportunity person with regard to success and prosperity. I'm not just for my success and prosperity. You understand, this is my problem. Most of these pastors, they walk into church, they do their thing, they go home, that's it. My problem is... I am genuinely an equal opportunity, success, and prosperity guy. I want to see everybody prosper. And sometimes this works against me because people feel like I'm putting pressure on them. I'm not putting pressure on you. I want to prod you. I want to cajole you. I want to encourage you. I want to uh, do what I can to encourage you to be a success at what you're doing and to prosper. 
Does that make sense? But that's the way I was with my kids. I didn't want them to fail. I wanted them to succeed. I wanted them to be blessed. I wanted them to prosper. Beloved, 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. So that's what's in my heart. See, then, because that's what's in my heart, my heart never condemns me when I get blessed because I'm happy when you get blessed. My heart never condemns me when somebody blesses me financially because I'm happy when somebody blesses you financially. You know, even though it's been a half a dozen years since I got an increase, uh, I'm not complaining, it's just the economy. When I hear... Uh, these testimonies of people, you know, getting 5%, 10%, 15%, I'm happy for them. You know, you know what I'm thinking? Well, praise God, somebody's getting it. <laughs> I'm happy for them. I'm happy for them. Go ahead and catch me if you can. Pass me. Just tithe while you're doing it. <laughs> Am I helping anybody tonight? Say it out loud. It's not just about confession. It's, not just about it's about the attitude. It's, about it's not just about confession. About it's about the heart. I'm not going to produce anything other than what I am. So to change my life, to change my circumstances, to change the outcome of my life, I've got to change who I am. Now, I didn't bring the reference, but how do I do that? How do I do that? Romans 12. I have to renew my mind to the Word of God. I've got to renew, I've got to change my mind. I've got to change my thinking. I cannot change my heart until I change my mind. And you can't do that. I don't think you can do that in five minutes. I don't think you can do that reading the Bible once. It takes, it takes meditation, it takes time, and then it takes meditation, it takes time, and then you backslide, you backslide. You go back to, you know, if I stood here tonight and told you what I heard in my house growing up as a child, you would be shocked. You would be appalled. You have to get past it. You have to get past your roots. You have to get past some stuff. But ain't nobody holding you back but you. Because now you're all grown up, you know? I came across that yesterday in, in my study. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So maybe what you need to do, some of you here tonight, you need to put your Xbox out in a yard sale. <laughs> because that's part of the reason these boys don't grow up and they don't find a woman and get married and get a real J-O-B is they're still boys. They're still boys. This electronics thing is bad. They're still boys. I do not understand how young men cannot be interested in women. This is completely beyond my comprehension. So maybe I need to put away childish things. Maybe I need to put away the Xbox or whatever the latest, greatest thing is. But you know what else I need to put away? Maybe I need to put away some bad attitudes and some cliches and some patterns that I learned from mom and dad. If they do not contribute to your success and your prosperity, give them up. And establish a new pattern. Okay, I'm out of time. This is why we conduct ourselves the way we do. Because I am fully cognizant that I'm not just a pastor of a church. I'm a role model. I'm fully aware of this. So I just can't do what I want to do. I just can't go where I want to go. I just can't go around town giving people a piece of my mind, right? When they cut me off on the highway, I can't give them hand signs. I mean, okay, but wait a minute, you are too. 
You are for your husband. You are for your wife. You are for your children. But wait a minute. You are for your unsaved friends, neighbors, relatives. Okay, being cognizant of this helps you establish those new patterns. See? Because you just can't do what you used to do. You just can't hang out where you used to hang out. You just can't say what you used to say. You just can't involve yourself in the activities you used to involve yourself in. So we have to change. And maybe you were lacking something with mom and dad. Study. Study great people. Figure it out. Study great people. And I'll tell you a secret about great men of God. They're not perfect. And I'm not going to name names and give the attributes, but I could, I could list my fathers in the faith, and I could stand here, and I could tell you the positives and the negatives. But I'm not going to do that. Because there were seven or eight of them, and here's what I did. I focused on the positives. And so there might have been some weaknesses in some other areas, especially in child rearing. Because sometimes to become great, they neglected their families. But here's my point. I studied them, and I studied the positives. I studied them as a group. I studied them, and I imitated the positives. Does that help anybody? And that's how I established positive patterns in my life. Because I didn't want to be like mom and dad. I didn't want to be like what I saw growing up. The earliest recollection of my life, I would have been maybe three, four. The earliest recollection of my life is hiding behind the sofa at that house in Highland Park, Michigan, while my mom and dad were throwing things at each other, ashtrays, lamps, whatever. That's the earliest recollection of my life. So whatever, 54 years later, I'm rehearsing this. Why? Because I made up my mind. I didn't want to live like that. I didn't want a home life like that. I didn't want to participate in that. I didn't want to carry on that tradition or pattern. Well, if I don't want to live like that, if I see something I don't like, I have to break it. I have to exercise my will because it won't just happen. I've got to do something. And the place to begin is renewing the mind and then don't, don't fall in line with this culture to be bitter about pe successful people or to be angry about uh, rich people or to... And look, it's all bogus because all these people that don't like rich people are all buying lottery tickets. It's bogus. It's not really resentment against the rich. What it is, it's envy and jealousy because... They didn't figure out how to make that money. But you're smart. You're here. You're learning about confession. You're changing your perspective. You're changing your tree. You're changing your heart. The confession will follow. Health will follow. Success will follow. Prosperity will follow. Why? Because if you change the tree, you change the fruit. And you say amen? Amen. amen. God bless you tonight.